Good morning, good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's Institute of Export and International Trade webinar on export control regulation in India. This is a webinar being run for the Institute's export control profession and I'm delighted to see delighted to see so many of our ECP members on the line today. My name is William Barnes Graham and I am the Senior Content Editor at the Institute and I will be your host today. And we're looking forward to lots of interaction from you, our audience, over the next hour. Now, an essential task for any export control professional is to stay up to date with all the changing regulations, licensing processes, and sanctions that may affect your trade into and out of any particular market you are dealing with. That is certainly the case for India today, which is our, the market we will be hearing about. You will hear from two export control experts from India in Amita Degal, who is a partner at DGS Associates, who's joining us from New Delhi, and Sanjay Natani, a partner at Economics Law Practice, who is in Mumbai. Delighted to have you both here today, Amita and Sanjay. Hi there. Hi. Hi, Thank everyone. You. Now, before Sanjay and Amita, uh, we will be hearing from Roger Arfi, the chairperson of the Institute's export control profession, and he will briefly talk about the support we provide to people working in this space. But before handing over to Roger, I'd like to run a quick poll. So we move to the next slide, please. And we just basically want to know a little bit more about who you are representing today. Um, so the options there are an Indian organization with no overseas subsidiaries, an Indian organization with overseas subsidiaries, a non-Indian organization with subsidiaries in India, a non-Indian organization with no subsidiaries in India, India, and none of the above. And while I let people answer that poll, Roger, delighted you've been able to join us again today. To set a bit of context, why are webinars such as this one, so important for people working in this sector. We're finding webinars an incredibly good way of understanding and learning about uh, situations, regulations, uh, what's going on. Um, they bring a personal touch to, to the learning process, which uh, reading documents can't do. Um, it means that you're hearing uh, information from the, the voice of the person who's uh, presenting the information. And it also gives the opportunity for feedback uh, and for questions and answers, which obviously reading a document doesn't do. Um, and in the current climate, when people aren't traveling, um, it's easier than getting, or it's, it's possible, whereas it's not, it's not easy to get to um, conferences or meetings. But with a webinar, you can have that interaction at your own desk. So they meet a lot of requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And just to quickly share the results to that poll. Uh, so 45%, uh, not far, 50% are a non-Indian organization with subsidiaries in India. 29% uh, non-Indian organization with no subsidiaries in India. 22% uh, none of the above. And only the 4% Indian organizations and they all have overseas subsidiaries. Uh, now, finally, from me, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right hand side of your screen. And secondly, you will receive a copy of today's side pack and a recording of today's webinar later this week. So my recommendation is to really listen in to today's speakers and what they have to say. But on that note, I've moved to the next slide. It's my pleasure to hand over to Roger. Over to you, Roger. Thank you very much, Will. Well, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to, to be part of this webinar on an important subject, uh, the um, regulations, export control regulations in India. Um, it's a subject that is in increasingly important uh, as more and more uh, organizations are into, in, uh, interacting with Indian companies. Um, India is becoming, a, is a growing area both for manufacturing but also for technology uh, and the new regulations or these, the regulations we're going to hear about today are very important to understand so that uh, 
organizations both within India, but also organizations that are outside India, but interacting with uh, India organizations, understand the regulations and make sure that they're complying with them. We're doing this under the umbrella of the export control profession. Uh, and just briefly about our profession, we are the only professional body in the UK, especially for export control personnel. We've been created and it is led by export control specialists. We have a team of export control specialists who are advisors to our parent organisation, the Institute of Export. We promote professional development and professional recognition. Recognition we do through post-nominal letters for members and uh, associate members. Uh, and in terms of professional development, we provide a range of training and development opportunities uh, and resources to enable increased compliance. And of course, today's webinar is exactly one of those things, an opportunity for people to hear and learn about export controls that may well be very important to them, if not now, in the future. So I'd like to pass over to Sanjay now, who's going to start through the uh, presentation on the regulations uh, and then Amita will follow him up with some more information later. So Sanjay, thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Shirley Institute of Export and International Trade, William Roger and his team for giving us this opportunity to represent India. And of course, everyone in the attendance for your interest on uh, India's export control regulations. Uh, today's webinar will focus on India's dual use and defense export controls. We will devote significant attention to the recent additions and revisions to the SCOMET list. Apart from the licensing and compliance aspect, with brief introduction to the regulation as made applicable in India. Throughout the webinar, we will also highlight issues you and your firm may encounter when seeking to do business and export strategic commodities from India, as we heard technology is becoming day and day important. We hope that you will find this information to be useful and I have thought uh, to provide you with numerous valuable takeaways within the presentation, particularly uh, on the section and the hyperlinks with the slides. We've provided you some of these links so that, you know, once you have this presentation available to you, uh, hopefully you will not need lawyers like us. Uh, lastly, we will also spend a few minutes of the webinar addressing your specific questions. In the event uh, we do not have the opportunity to answer your question, please feel free to email uh, in the aftermath of the webinar and, uh, and we will do our best to address all your questions and uh, issues. Now, coming to the Prima Facie agenda here and giving you a little brief background as to how this regulation works, what is the mechanism, which is the ministry, and what is the uh, sections and the rules which make applicable to the India's export control legal framework. So the first thing, it is divided into two parts. One is the legislative and the executive part. The legislative part is the part where the Foreign Trade Development and Regulation Act 1992 is India's primary trade law. Most goods are freely importable and exportable, but the FTDR enables the government of India from time to time to regulate and license the export and import of specific goods, services, and technology, which also includes dual use and munitions related goods, software and technology, as well as to formulate India's foreign trade policy. The WMD Act, which is the Weapons of Mass Destruction and the Delivery System Prohibition of Unlawful Activities Act 2005, expanded India's export control provisions and the scope of export uh, and the scope of control on the export, retransfer, transit, transshipment, and brokering of specified goods, services, and technology related to WMD and their means of delivery. In 2010, uh, the FTDR, by way of an amendment act, updated the FTDR Act and subsumed the provisions found within the WT Act. The amended FTDR Act stipulates that goods, services, or technology under Chapter 4 of the FTDR Act must be exported, transferred, retransferred brought in transit or transshipment in accordance with the provisions of the FTDR, 
the WMD Act or any other relevant act. Next. Next. So this is the whole framework which we wanted to sort of cover and this is where the main regulations lie. Uh, can I have the next slide? Now comes the foreign trade policy. Foreign trade policy enables the DGFT to regulate commerce in several broad categories. It designates restrictions on trade by country and stipulates export and import requirements for trade in different types of commodities. The foreign trade uh, policy is created in a five-year incremental and updated annually. Updates are published on the official gazette and are available on the DGFT website. The FTP also enumerates India's country and product specific prohibitions, which includes sanctioned countries such as Iran, North Korea, Iraq, and other countries which are designated as sanctioned countries by the United Nations from time to time. The handbook of procedures outlines the rules related to applying for obtaining and using an import or export license. It is also created in a five year incremental and updated annually. Uh, the current one is from the period of 2015 to 2020, but unfortunately, due to COVID, it's been extended uh, so motto uh, by the government. And hopefully, at the end of the year or early next year, we will get to see the new foreign trade policy and the regulations accordingly. As far as the regulation concern, uh, the export control regulation comment particularly has these four boxes which has the length and breadth of the whole regulation. One is it is product specific. So there is a comment list of items for which there is an export license required. Country specific, as I said, there are certain countries and sanctions. India does not have uh, a sanction regulation as America, you may have heard that they have specific country uh, sanctions which are taken up by the President of United States along with the Congress. As far as India is concerned, we clearly adopt the United Nations uh, sanctioned regulation and uh, accordingly inculcate in our uh, regulation. There is something known as end user specific, which is basically to un understand that which are these terrorist and non-state actors, which is a list which is jointly uh, put together by countries together who are part of the regulators such as Wassenaar agreement and certain other countries and along with uh, countries which with India operates with. And there is something known as end use specific, which is to understand that what is the product and what is the use of that, particularly when it comes to use in WMD and its delivery methods. Next. Now, this is Keeping in mind, this is the broad category of how things work here. Now, consider this thing that there is an exporter from India who would like to export this product, which is currently regulated under the export control regulation. So the product is the first part of it, which is there are categories of comet items which are given under these categories, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. The products, goods, services, and technology which fall under this there is an application which is to be made to the DGFT, which is Director General of Foreign Trade. Depending on the kinds of goods, there is an inter-ministerial working group consultation, which has all the relevant ministries, Ministry of External Affairs, Department of Atomic Energy, Department of Chemicals, depending on that. And then going forward, uh, once you have a no objection certificate, accordingly, depending on that, either a license is issued or denied. Uh, come to category zero. This is particularly goods dealing with nuclear and atomic, which is where it goes to the Department of Atomic Energy, and that is where is the application which needs to be made. Accordingly, the Department of Atomic Energy, along with its ministries and other ministries with whom it needs to consult with, an NOC depending on that, and again, the license is either issued or denied. Coming finally to the munitions list, which is covered under category six, which is undertaken and uh, falls under the Ministry of Defense. 
uh, there are certain countries with which we have negative list of country and other country there is an mea consultation uh, or either there is no consultation depending on uh, which country are we talking about which is where the exports have to be made uh, again there is a no objection certificate and the license is accordingly issued and denied so basically keeping in mind uh, these are the sort of the overarching uh, regulations ministries and the application process and of course it sort of apart from the main customs act which is of course the 1962 which provides a levy of duty on the imports into exports from india we have also certain ancillary laws that relate to the foreign trade regulation act such as the arms act 1959 the Atom atomic energy act the chemicals weapon weapons convention act the explosives act the environmental protection act and the unlawful activities prevention amendment act which all of these sort of apply to the regulation next slide now if you note uh, that this is what i explained in my earlier uh, slide but very very important to sort of understand some of this is that under category 7 there are certain biological items which are covered under category 2 may also require secondary approval so like i explained while you may file some of the applications depending on the product with the dgft depending on there are certain exceptions to certain products which may require secondary approval and that is where the concerned ministry steps in uh again coming to the example of the department of atomic energy which has or denotes certain category 0 items which are covered under uh, category 0 or they are nuclear and nuclear dual use that are licensed by the department of atomic energy uh, the schedule is available of course export of these items is regulated by the atomic atomic energy act and the rules framed under an application for the license accordingly shall be made in writing to the joint secretary to the department of atomic energy so that is where your application will go same way like we explain the department of defense production which is known as ddp ministry of defense this is where you will have if you are ex exporting any item which is defense related you will go under the munitions list and that is where the application will be made in my slides i have covered some of these uh, uh, licensing issues and we will take you through that next slide yeah let's go to the next slide yeah now uh, this is the scope of india's export control which is by the type of items involved in the transfer and transaction controlled or restricted end user end use and destination the type of trade or the transaction or the trade flow which is involved either direct export import the individual or the business is involved in the trade transaction and the location where the transaction takes place it's also very interesting to understand when we say the type of items involved in the transfer and technology uh, doesn't go without uh, mentioning certain sort of definition on goods services technology and software of course very easy to understand goods and the and the physical uh, nature and character of the product but when it comes to services and when we say export of services very interestingly india has followed the definition of services as understood under the agreement of gatt under the wto which is in relation to the services or technology it's saying supplying services or technology from india into the territory of any other country in india to the service consumer of any other country by a service supplier of india through commercial presence in the territory of any other country or by a service service supplier of india to presence of indian natural persons in the territory of any other country so basically it follows the mode different modes of services technology i i think one of the most important definitions as practitioners and as industry is the whole meaning of the word technology and the way the technology is defined is very important to understand some of the words and the meaning and the interpretations given over a period of time whether by the regulator in india or by way of doing businesses around the world the way 
technology is defined it says technology means except as otherwise provided for against any item in the schematic list information including information embedded in the software other than information in the public domain that is capable of being used in the development of production or use of any goods or software the development of or carrying out of any industrial or commercial activity or the provision of service for any kind and it says also in terms of the explanation when technology is described wholly or partly by reference to the uses to it it may be put it shall include services which are provided or used which are capable of being used in the development production use of such goods and technology finally it also means to say to further add that technology includes the technical data and technical assistance as far as technology is concerned the other definition which has become very very important is software and software means a collection of one or more programs or micro programs fixed in any tangible medium of expression however unless and otherwise provided for and against any item on the schematic list the list does not control software which is either in the public domain or is generally available by being sold from stock at retail selling point or designed for installation by the user with a without further substantial support by the supplier it however minimum necessary includes the object code for the installation operation maintenance or the repair of controlled item which is to be taken into consideration so these are very very important definition to understand that how the scope of india's export control is understood next slide now what is the list of the comet list how this list is to be defined the list of dual is known as comet this is the meaning of comet which is the special chemicals organism materials equipment and technology in short we call it comet it is located in appendix 3 of schedule 2 of the itc hs code which is the import export classification code items found require an export license from the dgid it's a unique five digit alpha numeric classification and it keeps on keeps on uh, changing and making the amendments uh, the indian government may also notify any item as being subject to export control provisions and which and when such items is exhibited sold supplied or transferred to a foreign entity or a foreigner who is a resident operating visiting studying conducting research or business within the indian territory or airspace or an sec uh very recently we been getting a lot of questions especially people who have been flying and flying out for projects for technologies for setting up offices and depending on the kind of information we are talking to that extent uh, during covid we been of course sharing a lot of clarification to say that if because of covid we cannot come to india but if we are attending a webinar or a zoom or a call with our colleagues back in india and if there is any information which is being taken out of india is that to be covered under the license so uh, we will address some of these issues as we go further next slide so broadly this is the way the export controls work to encapsulate the foreign trade regulation act the foreign trade policy and the handbook of procedures then we have the itc hs which is the classification the schedule 2 which is contains the export licensing schedule and accordingly under the table a we have a comment list of items which are given there uh, the other relevant acts which i have spoken to you also are made applicable to this and finally we have country based restrictions applicable to be taken into consideration when you go forward and seek a license next slide now which are the items which are subject to control both new and used goods are subject to export control very interesting uh, is important to stress on this co mingling and integration because we are seeing the kind of products and nature of product uh whether they are pure uh technology goods or whether they are commingled with one or two components taken together so the comet list actually 
specifies that non control goods containing one or more controlled items when the controlled component or components are the principal element of the goods and can be feasibly be removed or used for other purposes are still subject to indian export controls because a lot of time we see that these are certain questions which we need to keep in mind while taking into consideration and of course uh, uh, amita will cover that from a compliance perspective this is very very important to understand that how we take care of the due diligence we take care of the compliance and ultimately the licensing mechanism which is uh, what we will be discussing today next slide as far as uh, india is concerned we've also uh, revised and the handbook of procedure now expands the indian casual controls to include even military end uses uh, the wmd act and the foreign trade regulation act by an amendment uh, uh, stated in the law that no person shall export any material equipment or technology knowing that such material equipment or technology is intended to be used in the design or manufacture of a biological weapon chemical weapon or other explosives the prohibition also extends to brokering or facilitating the execution of transactions when the broker or facilitator is aware about the transaction in question relates to the wmd act of course the military use is also defined in the handbook and the scomet list incorporates it saying incorporation into military list items under category 6 for the use development or production of military items listed under this category next slide this is uh, very quickly uh, applies to all of india including the scg like i explained earlier it also applies to citizens of india outside india companies or bodies corporate registered or incorporated in india or having their associates branches or subsidiaries outside india any shipped aircraft or other means of transport registered in india or outside india whether it may be while also applicable to foreigners while in india and persons in the service of the government of india which within and beyond india uh, it does not incorporate concepts and control standards such as the de minimis content this is something which we have not yet uh, considered as part of the regulation indian technology must be a principal element for it to be subject to control and there are certain sort of sections given on each of these thing as to how the extra territorial or retransfer restrictions on comet items when exported from india are concerned and the government of india may also require certain uh, sometimes additional formal assurances as deemed appropriate including those on end use on retransfer from the state of the recipient or additional end use conditions may be stipulated in authorization for export of items or technology that bear a possibility of diversion or to use any development or manufacture in developments of mass destruction next slide india of course does not maintain its own restricted parties or designated entities list the way we know it as del denied entities list india as uh, i explained before it follows the united nation sanction list however based on our day to day working we understand that the ministry of external affairs also has a list which of course is not available in the public domain and uh, unfortunately not uh, around with us but this is where it is considered that this list is available and uh, accordingly on the basis of the application to whom it is being exported to will be taken up by the ministry next slide so this is where the restrictions or to specified persons and locations come uh, th this is very clearly under the foreign trade policy para 2.16 to 2.18 and we are there to the uh, unsc entity individual or country sanctions or embargo list the way we have through notifications and public notice also of course there could be certain list which may be available to india uh, because of certain other common countries who are part of the wider regulations as such as watson or australian group from where we can collect all these lists and accordingly we sort of uh, take it from time to time keep on amending these lists next 
So this is uh, also applicable to the types of control transfers beyond physical exports, which is tangible and intangible transfers of technology necessary. Uh, very recently, there have been a lot of questions on cloud, on the servers, whether the servers are in India, the servers are outside India, and how does it uh, uh, take into consideration uh, while transferring anything, even if it is not available in India, but the control is in India, and those are certain sets of questions uh, which come to us often from time to time, especially if you're dealing with one of the companies which is in technology or software, or even if they are using some very modern systems to control certain items which could be covered under the export control. Now, very quickly, I will uh, go through the, uh, the licensing process next. Yeah, now this is where the SCOMED licensing process comes in. So very, very quickly, uh, you must be registered, of course, with the DGFT and others to be eligible to apply for a SCOMED export license. So there is something known as an IEC code, which is an import-export code, which a company needs to take before it sort of decides to even take a license. DGFT is the primary dual use licensing agency. There are other government agencies and category zero and six is not to go to the DTFT, but straight away go to the appropriate parent ministry, which controls these items, which is the DEAE and DDP. Next. Uh, as far as the process is concerned, surely it's not because of COVID, but prior to COVID, India had already got into an online electronic licensing system known as ECOM. Uh, there are few license exceptions available, uh, particularly given that licensing review and issuance process can vary in practice. Uh, usually while we could say it takes about 30 days depending on the kind of product, who is applying, whether there is a precedent about it, uh, the licenses decisions can sometimes take up to 60 days. So before you decide to sign any contract, before you decide to ship any product, please uh, very well get in touch with the DGFT and they will try and expedite and rectify the situation in order to ensure that contractual needs are followed. Next, uh, so this is the uh, registration which requires a PAN number, which is a permanent account number, uh, an ID card that allows you to also uh, take into consideration the registrations of the income tax department. Uh, this is the IEC code. Next is to make a profile, establish using this, and there is an ANF1 form, which is a profile of importers and exporters, and this is submitted to the DGFT depending on where your office is registered within India. Uh, next. Individual, of course, uh, SCOMET export licenses. This is the form ANF20. Uh, it's an online form. Uh, there is also something very recently due to uh, the uh, a lot of industry guys, especially in technology, wanted a general authorization for intra-company transfers where it's a blanket license given to uh, people. Uh, right now, as things stand, uh, Amita will speak about it, but basically it is only any technology transfer which is made to subsidiaries and uh, not so far given to any outside. Uh, countries that benefit must also provide mutual exemption for India. And of course, we had hoped hoped it better, but so far as possible, this is what is available. So these are the two types of licenses which are there. Of course, there is also something known as repeat licenses, depending on what products you keep on uh, selling to different clients and different customers around the world. And on the basis of that, your license could be expedited and taken forward from there. Next. Application for the uh, summit uh, items, as I explained earlier, is reviewed by the IMWG. Uh, that is where your licenses are taken care of. This is the submission form which you will have to fill. So we've actually taken a snapshot and uh, put it up there. It's quite easy, easy instructions, easy following. In fact, you have an FAQ, you have an help desk and everything you can do online. Uh, next. This is a snapshot of a DGFT online where you can put actually the ITCHS code, the SCOMET item number, the category name of the export description, and 
like i said there is a repeat basis which will help them to understand that if you've already exported something earlier then how do they track this through the license and uh, follow accordingly next now this is important that there are various columns where you have to give some of this information like the most important is also to understand the uh, depending on what are the kinds of categories of items which you are exporting and accordingly there are forms given under that uh, which is on the basis of appendix 2s1 uh, 2s2 2s3 which is applicable for stock and sale authorization depending on the nature of the transaction what you are doing please go through these forms there is a very clear process given all supporting documents have to be uploaded using your pdf files and also you will have to submit original end user list or certificate uh, depending on who all are the entities involved in the supply chain and accordingly these need to be provided to the summit authority and uh, the uh, there is of course an online final assistance available and the traders whoever in case if there are any traders or distributors involved they may check on the status of a license online through the dgft website next this is uh, like i had explained there is an imwg process uh, usually earlier it used to take a lot of time now the system has started expedited in fact earlier the meetings regular meetings which used to be held they used to be held in a room where different uh, personnel from each ministry used to come forward not any more now actually everything is become an online system and there is clearly easy process involved unfortunately there is no codified time frame given for the dgft licensing decision the im wg has 30 days but on an average it takes about 12 to 18 weeks depending on the process next the criteria now of end user again very very important the credentials of the end user the credibility of the declarations of the end use of the item and technology in integrity of the chain of transmission of items from the supplier to end user potential of the item including the timing of its exports to contribute to the end users that are not consistent with india's national security or the foreign policy all these are considered on the basis of on the basis of which the license needs to be granted the risk also that the items will fall into the hands of terrorists or non state actors export control measures instituted by the recipient country in fact also is very important depending on certain countries do not have a very uh, formal process of going through it the capabilities and the objectives of programs of the recipient state related to weapons and the delivery the stated end use of the items application to the relevant bilateral or the multilateral agreements to which india is a party all these are considered by the imwg group next hi sanjay so just to is... quickly interject if um because we've not got um we've only got an hour so and we'll put over one yeah. today so i'll, I'll just the next few slides quite quickly please. absolutely i'll do that so very quickly i'll just go through it this is the administration process this is the review process uh how do you get to know there is an appeal process if your application gets rejected and this is where it is taken into consideration uh post license considerations next slide once a comet license is given to you it is valid for 24 months unless specifically noted by the issuing authority it may be renewed or validated by additional 6 months depending on how your licensing or whether you've performed or not performed and accordingly there could be a licensing conditions which may be given to you at the time of uh, taking uh, the license please uh, while uh, amita will take care of it but of course the records and the documentation have to be kept for almost a period of 5 years and uh, there could be any inquiry which may come back there are certain next slide there are certain license exemptions which are given uh, depending on the repeat basis this is where it is and very clear uh, due to paucity of time it is very simple that uh, it talks about testing analysis stock and sale and all these goods next 
this is where uh, these are certain licensing tips based on our uh, uh, experience but these are very simple i will not uh, take too much time uh, because uh, amita is waiting in queue uh, but these are certain licensing tips which you should uh, read and follow it to take it uh, at the time of license next this is the licensing process for munitions list uh, whenever you have a category 6 item these are the ministry where you will have to seek a license the online application like the format is to be made under appendix 3 the list of documents are the copy of purchase order technical specifications and use uh, certifications next this is where in case if you have to have any re export of an item or a repair or a rework these are the uh, documents which you will need to follow it up next this is the licensing process depending on the kind of category of product they have given it to you there is a list involved under the munitions list and these are the part a b c d e f depending on the product depending on the export depending on the countries uh and on the side i have put it in brackets that what is the duration of the license is given to you this is what the duration under each of these parts covered are next this is again records to be maintained for 5 years if there is any appeal 30 days brokering is pro uh, prohibited timelines for exports are prescribed and detailed instructions also have been laid down for offset banking credits and proposals next That's it. Great, thank you, thank you, Sanjay. Um, and yeah, as uh, as you can see, there's a lot of information to take in there. Uh, just before I hand over to Amita, we do have a couple of questions, um, which I'd be glad to ask you while um, also allowing people to answer this poll. Just be, again, trying to find out a bit more about uh, what sorts of companies we have on the on the line today. Um, We've had a question in from Antonia asking, are there any exceptions for a license for the temporary exports of technology to conduct business overseas? And we also had a question from Lee who asked, would you be able to advise whether any aerospace related goods are captured under India's export control regime? So Sanjay, could you just answer those uh, couple of questions quickly before we hand over? Surely th there are certain license exceptions given however it is very important that we will need to understand that whether the kind of product which we are covered under the technology how important it is and critical ultimately to the end use or the final product so yes depending on that we, yes there is a possibility that there could be certain exemptions but we will have to interpret it and understand the whole nine yards of the product intended to be export uh, the second question as far as aerospace is concerned definitely uh, we have dealt with certain products something like a radar something like some of these uh, cameras high vision cameras which are installed while now on the ground it may seem very simple but depending on the where the need and the use of these products and if they are covered under aerospace and finally it is going for for defense yes uh, they are covered uh, under the export control regulations and classification list thank you Great, thank you, thank you, Sanjay. And just to share the poll results there, so uh, 22% goods, 10% technology, 22% both, and a fair few neither. So I wonder if we've got some uh, some interesting companies on the line today. But um, we'll ask a couple more questions at the end as well, following Amita's presentation. But no time to waste. Uh, over to you, Amita. Thank you so much, William. Good afternoon, everyone. we kind of uh, running short on time so i'll just head straight into the presentation while sanjay has covered the regulatory framework uh, that uh, encompasses the indian export controls and has taken you in detail through the licensing process what i will try and cover is uh, the need for compliance uh, in india of these export controls the enforcement uh mechanism that is in place and then we'll just talk through briefly uh you know through the recent uh, changes that have uh, uh taken place in the indian export controls and where are we looking uh, ahead uh what uh, what faces us in the future so just a quick uh, just to quickly uh, you know add to what sanjay had uh, presented um the indian export controls are pretty much in their nascent stage because uh, while 
technically they had been in place since uh, since you know uh, 90s and then 2010 there was a revamp uh, in the export controls but they were pretty much on paper not much talked about then came uh, in 2016 india signed the mtcr and then it was followed immediately with uh, the australia group in uh, 2017 early 2018 we signed wasenar and uh, suddenly there has been a lot of activity around the export controls and it is pretty much now uh, a well talked of uh, subject which was previously not the case so with that and and to add to this uh, india has been an adherent of the nsg since 2008 so we are pretty much covered you know uh, with all the multilateral uh, export control regimes and the law is uh, is focused around uh, these regimes compliance now compliance uh, uh, is of course uh, necessary because there is a there is a law in place around this but more than that compliance is also a necessity in terms of uh, uh, the global trade that is happening the cross border transactions that happen you are covered not just in india but you would be covered in the destination country itself you will be covered in, in the in the various transit countries that you have so export controls is something that you really need to comply with through your supply chain from start to finish and through the interim phase. Uh, the catch-all controls Sanjay has already talked of, uh, they're pretty broad. All you need is knowledge that the product is intended for uh, use and you are covered. Um, the two main legislations, the Weapons of Mass Destruction, the WMD Act, which is uh, which is the uh, which is what i call the umbrella legislation which governs export controls in india and by incorporation it has been uh, also referred to in the ftdr act and hence becomes part of the trade uh, regulation also so well, moving from there uh, let's yeah let be on the first slide the the scope and extent of the export control laws as sanjay has mentioned is an extra ter uh, territorial reach uh, which governs uh, uh, residents in india companies in india as well as indian citizens uh, outside india rendering services in today's times very relevant because technology is uh, is uh, uh, borderless is moving around the, your employees are moving around with their uh, systems with the uh, you know with the information with the trainings happening so everything is is making it more and more compelling for companies to comply with the export control uh, laws that are in place and for that uh, I've, I've just listed out the various, uh, you know, the various industry specific uh, people who need to look at export control compliance. We'll just move on to the next one. <clears throat> so, my, the compliance that I'm talking about uh, today is focusing more on, on self assessment self regulation self declaration because uh, uh, the indian authorities are right now not really capable of you know uh, enforcing each and every non compliance but the the penalties are such that the moment uh, a non compliance comes to their eye uh, companies can be in big trouble and that's why it's very important that companies uh, do look at uh, the internal compliance programs uh, which are not mandated in india as of now but are being incentivized uh, we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation where icps the existence of icps and companies are being incentivized by the authorities in terms of grant of licenses and exemptions so the icp that uh, that companies need to have uh, really regulate or manage the flow of information from the authorities to companies and vice versa. Uh, they ensure uh, that compliances are, uh, are in place. They avoid any ineligible exports to 
to ineligible end users or uh, sanctioned countries. Uh, the company with a strong ICP assumes a far greater credibility in the eyes of the regulators, and it is a testament on the company's commitment to adhere to the export control laws. Next one, please. Now, this is a question that is asked by us very often. The next uh, click, please. And the answer to this question can be nothing else but yes. We, we get this question very often whether uh, you know companies require an ICP in place. And, uh, and our advice to them can be nothing but that they must, must have because it prevents the companies from landing in situations which can be really detrimental to their business. Uh, the, the reluctance to have an ICP in place is, of course, uh, uh, a lot of companies, they don't want to set up a structure which is so detailed, which will be looking at all the ingredients of an ICP. And there is an expense involved in uh, getting an ICP in place. Next one, please. So the detriment behind uh, an ICP that the that the companies and uh, essentially the Indian companies we've uh, we've noticed uh, face the first one is because there is no uh, evident uh, uh, weightage being given or mandate being uh, issued by the authorities to have an ICP so there is an, a reluctance because it's a voluntary uh, uh, exercise that they have. But in addition to that, it's the entire uh, detail surrounding an ICP where you will have an organizational policy in place. You will identify specific roles. You will have, uh, you know, you will need to go in for a very detailed product identification and classification of your company's products, the kind of technology you are using. And uh, 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 let's say that, but, but if you have an ICP in place, which is which is shared with all the employees in the company, it has to be a pyramid because it has to flow from the top, top to bottom. So we need the management uh, trained in this and we need the employees trained uh, in the functioning of the ICP. What happens over here then is that the entire team in that company is, is aware of its obligations and once the awareness seeps in, the, uh, the compliance uh, sets into the company's uh, functioning. So the important uh, uh, ingredients would be what are your licenses and compliance checks? What is your end user, end use uh, screening happening? What kind of, uh, uh, you know, who's the carrier through which you are going to be sending? the product what is your exact product classification that's a big issue uh, in india because uh, uh, the uh, i i think globally because the uh, comet list that we have is not aligned with the itchs codes and hence there is a huge discrepancy in the product uh, uh, classification that we have and it ends up uh, you know possibly going leaving the country without the requisite uh, authorizations. If it leaves, uh, in fact, we've had a case, and interestingly, I had a case um, in recent past where uh, the goods did leave uh, India, uh, but were caught uh, in Europe while they were on their way to yet another destination. So in transit through one of the European countries, the goods were caught. Uh, a demand was made for the export control authorization and it wasn't there and then there was this entire uh, uh, issue around that which we eventually got it uh, resolved uh, got the export regularized but yes these are the uh, the threat of uh, not having a proper program in place next one please So since ICP itself is a best practice uh, as of now in India, these are just some of the ingredients that would, uh, you know, that uh, a company should bear in mind to ensure that it's uh, best practice, uh, that these best practices are 
inculcated in its uh, ICP. Uh, can we move on to the next one, please? So, so in the in the first poll, uh, I heard that a lot of companies, uh, a lot of attendees are uh, companies which are outside India having their subsidiaries uh, uh, within India. And uh, so this is very relevant for such companies because what happens is usually it's the parent company, ICP, which is kind of uh, adopted by the Indian companies also. However, the Indian companies do need to uh, uh, customize it to the local requirements. So there must be, even if they are adopting the parent company ICP, there must be an, uh, um, a review of the ICP in terms of the Indian laws to ensure that the local compliances are done. Um, the, the use uh, of all resources available, and there aren't very many in India, but whatever you do have, so it's the government websites, it's the various trainings being held, the various industry events around this uh, sector, particularly with technology, we do have a lot of industry events happening. And, um, uh, and whatever are the public resources available uh, for this. I would like to add my resource also, the book, uh, uh, my book on Indian export controls, laws and procedures has laid out the process in detail. It's a, it's a fairly decent uh, resource uh, available for this. Then uh, what is most important is to develop channels of communication with the various authorities. As Sanjay has mentioned, there are uh, several licensing authorities for this comment list, depending on the category in which you fall in. But the DGFT, the DDP, the external affairs ministries and the customs authorities, it's good to have, uh, you know, to communicate with them uh, regularly to ensure that uh, where your products are falling, whether you need authorizations and what uh, is happening. And lastly, is, is an automated tool that, that can be used, very useful for compliance. Uh, we, uh, we internally use the OCR uh, solution, but there are several out there which can be used. And uh, it, it's, it's almost uh, indispensable to com compliance, I would say. Uh, the next one, please. Hi, Mita. Sorry, just to interject. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, 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 I'm aware. I'm aware. Okay, so quickly, uh, enforcement, we can go to the next one, please. So enforcement can happen. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, enforcement can happen both under WMD Act and the Customs Act. You have imprisonments lined up to, uh, you know, from uh, six months to uh, seven years between the two acts, and you have fines. Customs is three times the value of the goods uh, which are uh, uh, which are seized. And then under the FTDR Act, you go in the denied entities list and your suspension of uh, uh, import-exporter code is also there. So quickly to move on to the export, uh, to the recent uh, updates, uh, we've had two recent updates, uh, the next one, please. We have uh, two recent updates on the comment list updation. The first one in 2019, April, it uh, up, uh, there was an updated uh, the munitions list and the uh, uh, technology list, uh, first went to the Vasana arrangement uh, revisions. And then we recently had last month an update uh, in the SCOMET list. Essentially in the chemicals category, again, uh, munitions and uh, technology. The next one, please. Uh, the first one is important. It's a global authorization for intra-company transfers, but this is only uh, relevant to, uh, to uh, goods or the technology which has been imported into India under certain license exceptions. So it, only if you have a license exception in place will you be able to uh, avail of this global authorization to send out the, to export the, the goods. The validity of uh, this authorization is three years, unlike the two years, which is there for the normal uh, goods, which are being uh, uh, normal export authorizations that are being issued. Uh, then we had the, the interesting part is the, 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 the tardy approach of the regulators that this came out in 2019, but the 
procedure, the application for this uh, global authorization was issued only uh, much later, uh, uh, in, earlier this year in March. Then we have, uh, uh, we've had some uh, easing of licensing process for goods coming into, in, uh, into India and leaving uh, India for repairs and replacements, whether they were exported from India to begin with or whether they have been imported into India and need to go out again for repair and replacement. Uh, the DDP, which is the Defense Ministry pertaining to munitions, has, uh, has issued two open general export licenses for intra-company uh, technology transfer and for exports of parts and components. Interestingly, both these OGELs as well as the global authorization upfront these are all hinging on the existence of an ICP in the company. So if you are able to show that you have an ICP in place, you are eligible for these licenses. I will not take too much time. Can we just move on to the next one, please? Uh, over here, the only uh, the one relevant one is that the, the, uh, the, for the defense ministry has uh, revised its standard operating procedure for, uh, for defense products. Which, uh, which has eased uh, the process for certain uh, uh, parts, components that need to be re-exported to be fitted into uh, the subsystems by the foreign buyers or the OEMs. The next one, please. I'm sorry to be rushing through it, but I think the presentation would be made available. Um, looking ahead, a lot has been done, but India is lagging far behind. Our licensing processes are a little slow. Although, although uh, earlier what used to take maybe months now can take anything between a week to maybe 30, 40 days. So I would say we have come a long way, but still lots to be done. Um, there is a, uh, there is a the, uh, you know, mind to, uh, mandate ICPs to set out the ingredients of ICPs by the licensing authorities. If that happens, then we do envisage a lot of uh, licensing exceptions to come into place uh, basis the ICPs that the company would be having. Uh, uh, the one, the one uh, uh, issue which I would like to really, uh, which I discuss with the authorities also regularly is the validated end user. This was a program that was used by the US also, not really taken off, but this is something which can be looked into by the Indian government, particularly with the member countries, the Vasana member countries or something. So if you have a validated end user over there, then make it uh, a general uh, license for these uh, this thing. I think that's uh, that's about it. Uh, do, we don't have much time left now, but uh, no, thank yeah. you so much. Over to you, Will. Thank you so much, Amita. Uh, as as you as you referenced, we don't have all that much time, but I'll do a couple of quick fire questions if that's okay. Um, uh, so I, I think we'll skip the poll just because we are overrunning. So. First question we had in was from um, so I'm just trying to load it up uh, from Swanim who asks, "What is your view on exports of technology as per the FTDR Act on Indians working outside of India?" Um, so I don't who, know who do you want? Uh, who do you want to take? Give this. Do you want to take that, Amita? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So, so. Uh, uh, Swanim, as, uh, as I had already mentioned, because of the WMD Act and the FTDR Act's uh, extraterritorial uh, applicability, even the Indian citizens who are traveling outside India, the, the, both the acts are applicable to such, uh, uh, to th such people. And that's why wherever the company employees are traveling from India to outside India, they would be subject to the Indian export controls. Thank you. And uh, another question we had in was from Hardikama, who asked, do I need a SCOMET license if I ship my product to a distributor in India and will they ship it to the end user located in Sri Lanka? Um, don't know if, uh, Sanjay, I don't know if you want to pick up that question. Sure. Uh, surely it will be covered under the license. Now, important is to understand the transaction and given the catch-all, does the does the 
particular company at the time of making that sale within the country knows that ultimately this is going to go out of india and being exported to sri lanka so definitely from that standpoint uh, yes depending on the role of the company it plays yes it should go out and uh, seek a license because ultimately it is going to be exported out of india excellent uh, thank you and we'll do one last question um, and this would be actually one for Roger. So Roger has asked, with regards to CPD development, how many credits would this webinar qualify for? Roger. I think you're on mute, sorry. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. The thing to do would be to uh, contact the uh, CPD uh, administrators and tell them about you know they've been attending to the, the, this this webinar and i'm sure they will be able to give an answer in fact um, they might actually be listening to this webinar as we speak today and have already decided what the answer to your question is the answer is one <laughs> well there you are thank you ian and um... without, without moving my lips Excellent. Well, um, thank you for stepping in there, Ian, and thank you so much to Sanjay, Amita, and Roger for joining us today. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of information there, so we really do hope you found that useful. Um, on the last slide, thank you. Um, just a reminder that by joining the export control profession, you get access to a support network of uh, people working in similar roles to you, a wealth of useful industry specific resources and events such as this one. And we also give regular updates on compliance matters globally and a continuing professional development program to ensure you can meet your obligations and maintain the highest of standards in international trade. To find out more, please do visit the website at www.exportcontrolprofession.co.uk and feel free to get in touch with us at institute.export.org.uk. For now, though, thank you for tuning in today. We hope you found the session useful. Apologies to have slightly run over, but uh, there's a lot of very good information there. So uh, please do take the exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to suggest any future topics. But for now, thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.